Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. Practice planning is so huge. I would imagine for you, I mean, every second of your day is pretty precious. That's why I'm thankful that you gave up the time to talk here. What, how do you, what's the process for you on going through what, what you decide to do in practice, what you choose to do, what you leave out? What's that process for you? Well, I mean, you, you've you obviously got, every coach has certain uh, values or certain skills or certain things that they absolutely believe in. And no matter what, we're going to be good at those, right? I've always been, a, and this is probably because, you know, I started my my college coaching career under a guy named Danny Casper. I, I probably, to this day, will never get away from the fact that I know we can play hard and we can play defense every single night. There's going to be nights where maybe we don't shoot the ball well. So you can grind out a game, even though I don't play slow, but you can grind out a game on the defensive end and still come out with a victory. So I'm always going to put in our defense first. I'm going to probably be for the first couple months, it's going to be 75% defense, just Mm -hmm. trying to get them to understand what we were trying to accomplish defensively. But also the defensive side of the ball to me, it, uh, it, 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 breeds toughness right it because it, it's not fun none of us want to guard 94 feet you know for 40 minutes a game they just you don't want to do that and so if you can get those guys to fight through and accept the fact that this is what we're going to be great at and if you do so then i'll give you some some freedoms offensively i think you're going to get to where you want to get as a team hmm. But back to your original question is, so I'm always going to go through guarding the ball one-on-one. Then I'm going to, and I've always been a a believer in starting with the parts till you get to the hole. So we'll go one-on-one to two-on-two to three-on-three to four-on-four to five-on-five. But even when we get to five-on-five, you know, you're still going to have to guard your man one-on-one so you don't put us in rotations. Yeah. You never lose sight of that. So I'll start there, but I've also come to learn in in my mind that these guys, you can't go five defensive drills in a row anymore. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe in 1995 or 98, you could have, but in, in 2023, you can't. So um, once I do a couple of warmup drills, typically things that involve a lot of communication, getting up and down the floor to break a sweat and get loose then I'll usually go right into one defensive drill and the most deep, important defensive drill that I want to cover for the day. Then I, I from there, I usually try to go defense, offense, defense, offense. So if I do a defensive drill, then we may do shooting next or we may do pick and rolls next. Or, But I'm going to come back to a defensive drill after that. And everything that we do in practice is going to be competitive. Um, so there's always a winners and a winner and a loser, and there's always a consequence if you don't, um, you know, ring the bell, if you don't win the game, if you don't meet the standard. So, um, that's kind of the way I've approached it as I get, you know, as the beginning of the season, uh, begins practices are longer, you yeah. talk, more. but then once I get into the season, man, I try to have those guys off the floor and you know, all 60 to 75 minutes. But in those 60 to 75 minutes, you know, we're going to go full speed. We're going to we're going to have wins and losses. Um, and that doesn't include like your warm ups. The 15 minutes that the strength coaches or the trainers or whoever does to warm up these guys, I, I don't count that as practice these days. I just don't. Yeah, that's their time. That's their show right there. That's their sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's not needed or. Oh, or no, it is but, important. But they, I feel like they're getting. <laughs> longer longer 
yeah. more in depth. At- coach Driscoll, uh, Matthew Driscoll is the uh, assistant coach at my senior year. And one time we, he just got us right into, to zigzag one-on-one right at the beginning. It's like, coach, no, no movement prep, nothing. He's, he told me, he said, you know, when a dog is sitting on the side of the road and a car goes by, it doesn't have to stretch. It just sprints after it. And then he laughed at everything. I remember thinking, like, what are you saying? Like, what, <laughs> what are you, what are you calling? What are you calling me right now? Okay, I, got, I was going to say the dog analogy probably wasn't the best. And Matt is right. a, a very peak. Uh, he's, he's PC for yeah. sure. But that's well, it's funny. But it was also it was early 2000s. So you, you you could say things like that. Um, no, but how – so you talked about competing in practice late in the year, even though it's only 60 to 75 minutes. Are you still bone-on-bone, bone, com- like, competing like that, or do you start to taper yeah. off? Yeah, no, we, we taper off. We absolutely taper off. But, <clears throat> you know, we'll get into scouting report at that point. And, uh, you know – it depends on the day, you know, sometimes I'll go <clears throat> offense, defense, offense, or I may go three possessions in a row um, where we have a scout team and you've got to defend it and those sorts of things. But yeah, we'll, we'll go, we'll go bone on bone. I don't, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I don't believe that you can uh, go through the motions, you know, Monday through Wednesday and be able to hook it up and, and yeah. fight Pete on, on Thursday. And I get it. Um, there is some risk involved with, injuries and those sorts of things but you know you i've seen guys roll their ankle and shoot around too so roll guy rolled his ankle and knockout we i thought hey, this will be fun before our first district game to kind of loosen us up we'll finish with knockout <laughs> best player rolled his ankle we haven't played knockout since um <laughs> but I, well, I think i think that's the balance though right and and i don't i don't have a good answer for that i i, I think from year to year maybe to, like if we've been somewhat healthy yeah, we'll push it a little bit longer. If we've been battling it all season long, then we might not risk it. But my my heart says, to your point, slippage is going to happen if we're only doing things five on zero, especially with high school kids, college kid, like college players. I think you you need to stay sharp. But man, that balance, I don't I don't know if there is a perfect way to do it. But like you kind of said, I, maybe it's more about the feel. Like, what do you feel in that time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and our, definitely our practices will fluctuate. I mean, there's, uh, I've, there's been days where I walked in and said, Hey, today we're only going to shoot. Right. And I listened to the trainers. I listened to my, my staff and they, they usually have a really good pulse on that kind of, kind of stuff. But I, I, the, the art of competing um, supersedes skill 99% of the time in my mind it just does unless you're just a a one percenter now you know those one percenters are are different but by and large um the team that competes the hardest that uh is the smartest that limits their turnovers that doesn't beat themselves they're going to win the majority of the games they just are In, in any sport i don't care what sport you're coaching yeah that's good <clears throat> you you mentioned how you do 75% of it is defense. How in the world do you get to where you're averaging 80 points a game? Because I would think if you're if you're I circled it. Cause I think if, if you're averaging that many, obviously the pace of play that could be generated by defense. If you're turning them over, creating harder shots for them, they're shooting a lower percentage, quicker possessions, but offensively, you got to be pretty darn good to do that too. Yeah. And you know what Um, we do, we were, you know, top 25 in the country um, in turnovers force per game and that kind of stuff. But I, I I think that uh, our biggest philosophy offensively is I want to score in the first 12 seconds of the shot clock. So in the simplest of terms, right. Everybody sends back one or two defensively and they're usually a guard. Right. And so if I can get the ball out and transition and I can get my big at the rim within three, four, five seconds, they're usually going to create my first mismatch because a guard is going to be guarding a big in the post. Mm-hmm. Well, the best shot in college basketball is the layup or the dunk. And so, you know, I'm going to fly the guys to the corner of the wings 
And then my point guard, he's going to push really, really hard, trying to get to the elbow, trying to get into the paint, trying to get us a dump off for a layup or a dunk or get his own layup or dunk. Um, and, and again, if I've created the mismatch at the rim with a big a guard on a big, well, now I've got a big guard and somebody else somewhere as well. And so if if you can score before the defense is set, that's going to be your best opportunity to score, right? And so I just we try to we try to instill in those guys that just you constantly have to put pressure on the rim, and um, you know if you can get easy ones through your defense, you know the run out layout layups and dunks and those sorts of things, man, you're you're going to really increase your numbers, but. Luckily at, at Corpus Christi, I mean, that 80 points a game that came also because we had several guys that offensively could really shoot the ball and, and, and knew how to play basketball. So it, it wasn't as much me as it was. It was. Then. <laughs> I love the idea of playing fast and trying to score early, you know, getting the guy to run to the rim. I, it makes a lot of sense, especially with getting that mismatch, getting guys to dangerous spots and corners. Are you finding that, like, is it easier to score early when you're keeping it that simple? Or is there a secondary break that rolls into it? Because to me, and I'll just give you a little bit of my opinion, I think the secondary break sometimes slows us down and, and takes away some of those early opportunities. But if you're able to, early offense, nothing is there flowing to secondary. I think it could work. But what are your thoughts with that? Um, early on in my career, we ran a, a very much a, a structured secondary break. <clears throat> the, as I've gone along in my career and just watched people, I've I've gotten away from it. Um, with that being said, you know, once the point guard hits the elbow, if we don't have a layup or a dunk, he kind of bounces out to the wing. So now you've got him free throw line extended and you've got a trail man. And then so now we we don't we don't have a structured break at that point. When we hit the trail. Um, you know, he could go back into a dribble handoff on the strong side. Now you've created kind of a zoom action. He can reverse the ball um, through the top of the key and chase it with a ball screen. He can go right into a ball screen for the point. You know, I don't tell them what to do at that point. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm telling them to read and react what the defense has given us. Now, with that being said, you know, we've talked about going into the game. Okay, hey, guys. They guard ball screens this way. So if they're, you know, for example, they don't switch and they may be hard hedge. Yeah. Let's reverse the ball a lot, right? Let's chase it with the ball screen, and then we can pick and pop our foreman, who hopefully is a good shooter, on a naked side where now they've got a decision to make. Are they going to switch it? If they stick with what they do, well, who's going to X out to the corner? You know, so now you're you're just – you're trying to pick apart what they do or manipulate what they do defensively and, and help yourself offensively. So we try to do that more often than not during yeah. that game, because that's the way they do things. I love the way you said that about the guy bouncing out, hitting the trail, and then the trail can do multiple things. Uh, Chris Oliver with basketball immersion talked about must actions versus possibilities. And how we want to get away from must actions, which is like you reverse it, he must do this. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a secondary does to us quite a bit is it boxes us into a lot of must actions that if that must action isn't there, what do we got? We're come out, set up something else. When you deal with possibilities, it's obviously more control to our players that maybe that's the scary part is they have to make more decisions. But what it's like goes back to Michael Jordan's quote, whatever they choose, the defense chooses, they're wrong. You give your players those possibilities, multiple things that they can choose to do. Man, that's where a really like free flowing offense, I think, comes from. Yeah. And, and again, if you have good spacing and you have guys that are intelligent and, and know how to play a little bit, <clears throat> you're just trying to put the defense in a bind, right? You're trying to get two people on the ball somehow, whether yeah. it's through a ball screen, whether it's through a zoom action that now creates someone rolling to the rim and you've got to bump the roller and now you've got to close out. I mean, you're, you're just trying to get the defense to shift. The worst thing that you can do from an offensive standpoint is allow the defense to be set and know what the heck you're going to do <laughs> and then guard it. I mean, the, the coach on the other bench is usually a good coach too. Um, so he's going to have his team prepared. 
I'd yeah. rather I'd rather put them in positions that they're they've got to think and react and and change um, than allow them to to say, okay, here's here's what they're going to run. Here you're going to run 55 red. Okay, we're going to guard 55 red this yeah. way. Yeah, that that timing of of the order of that is important. Like we want defense to react, coach to react to their reaction instead of coach react and defense reacts to him and is a, is prepared. I think any way that we can make that order of operations happen or the first one, that seems to be a good a good balance or a good idea. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.